panelists, uh, or all of our attendees, rather. Uh, my name is Victor Curran, and I'm with the Transcendental Council of Forest Parish. And I'm uh, happy to be here with uh, my wife, Diane Weiss, who is also a member of the Transcendentalism Council and who actually is the uh, one who introduced me to Margaret. Uh, and we are very, very happy this evening uh, to welcome uh, Phyllis Plum Cole. Uh, Dr. Cole is Professor Emerita of English and Women's Studies at Penn State Brandywine. Uh, she's a leading authority on women in the transcendentalist movement. Uh, and is the author of Mary Moody Emerson and the Orig Origins of Transcendentalism. Uh, and she is the co-editor of uh, Toward a Female Genealogy of Transcendentalism. Uh, and she's past president of both the Margaret Fuller Society and the Ralph Waldo Emerson Society. Uh, she's the inaugural recipient of the Fuller Society's Phyllis Plum Cole Award uh, for Social Service, and that's awarded to a person extending the, the social ideals of Margaret Fuller. Uh, I will, just, uh, just a matter of housekeeping, I will ask you to, to remain muted during the lecture. Uh, we will have Q&A at the end of the, uh, of the session, and you are welcome to use the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions uh, for Dr. Cole at the end of the lecture. Uh, and so with that, I will welcome uh, Phyllis Cole to speak on Margaret Fuller and the American Women's Movement. Thanks, Victor. Hello, and thanks for joining this virtual session earlier the same evening as the first Biden-Trump debate in fact, it's a remarkable piece of timing, isn't it? Linking our shared interest in Margaret Fuller to this political season. Here we are just after the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in this year of the centennial of women's suffrage in America. Voting matters, presidential elections matter. And part of my talk this evening will describe Fuller as an important resource in the 72 year history of the fight for suffrage. But Fuller's feminist manifesto, Woman in the 19th Century, was published in 1845, three years before the commonly accepted starting point of agitation for the vote at Seneca Falls. And it really belongs to a wider history of the American women's movement before and after, as well as during the suffrage years. I've recently been reading a little known biography of Fuller published in 1920, just after the right to vote was approved. Its author, Catherine Anthony, presents Fuller as the avatar of a modern feminism that can be pursued, she says, now that suffrage is out of the way. Interestingly, Catherine An Anthony was a distant cousin of suffrage leader Susan B. Anthony, who went to jail in defense of her right to vote. But Catherine was finding her way to another leader, to a revolutionary 20th century, philosophically encompassing emancipation beyond suffrage. So let's consider Margaret Fuller, before, during, and after the campaign by women for the vote. This will be a fairly extensive story, but one that jumps among episodes I want to leave plenty of time for discussion and don't want to keep us from that upcoming debate. In 1845, women in the 19th century did not argue for suffrage, but laid groundwork for it by claiming the tradition of political rights and liberty for women. As Fuller wrote, the American Revolution had given voice to the great law, the golden certainty that all people are born free and equal. As this principle was understood, protest on behalf of equality would necessarily result. Protest for the injured red and black races and her immediate concern here for women. Her essay amounts to this protest for women, or as she first entitled her essay, this great lawsuit 
for women, she said, have lost a birthright in the human race that must now be reclaimed. Their subordination in marriage, their non-existence according to the laws of property and guardianship of children were injustices that aroused Fuller's sympathy and wrath. But as part of this exclusion, of course, American courts didn't allow women to present a lawsuit. So she, as defense attorney, went to what she called the root of the whole, the natural law of the universe, in an appeal addressed to the public. As this turn from civil law to nature suggests, Fuller was also arguing as a transcendentalist for the soul of women, and the recovery of their birthright would be a religious transformation as well, both for them and for the human race as a whole. Women were li living a half-life of dependence and needed to discover their inner potential. There is but one law for souls, she proclaimed. What woman needs is not as a woman to act or rule, but as a nature to grow, to live freely and unimpeded, to unfold such powers as were given her when we left our common home. In other words, women needed to be self-reliant. Fuller's friend Emerson had made that phrase famous, but she applied it in a radically new direction to women's need not to be dependent on men. Indeed, most radically, she defined female and male as a great radical dualism, perpetually passing into one another rather than a polarity. From such affirmations arose her critique of marriage as society had conceived it, to prevent wives from owning themselves. So unmarried Fuller had the nerve to advise women to be in no haste to get married. Ideally, marriage could rise in stature from everyday partnership to real union, shared spiritual pilgrimage. But she insisted, union, union is only possible to those who are units. I wish woman to live first for God's sake, then she will not make an imperfect man her God and thus sink to idolatry. The brilliance of Fuller's essay is its double positioning in politics and religion, its intertwined arguments on the basis of rights and spiritual rebirth. If the American Revolution lies behind it, so does the Bible and its prom promise of a coming millennial, millennial age, or she calls it a future Eden. She echoes the words of Jesus, knock and it shall be open, seek and ye shall find. But she also invokes the great goddesses of other traditions, Egyptian Isis and Greek Minerva, for women to imitate in their search. Her own religious background was in the Unitarian Church but she went beyond it by claiming this inner consciousness as the primal human resource evoked in multiple faith traditions. European romantics like Wordsworth and Goethe first offered such affirmations, but Fuller and her friends made a creed and practice of them. So Fuller was preaching a transcendentalist free religious sermon in this essay. Of course, as a woman, she was not permitted to preach any more than she was permitted to argue her lawsuit in court. But she found the voice to do both from within herself, the very power she was claiming for other women as well. And so Fuller also laid groundwork for the suffrage movement, emphasizing the need for representation and voice on the part of women. And she doesn't argue specifically for the vote she does point out as ludicrous men's ominous pictures of ladies in hysterics at the polls and Senate chambers filled with cradles. Men's custom of speaking for and about women, even at the polls, is precisely the problem. And she positions her argument so much within an indictment of America's failures, especially its perpetuation of slavery, that of course women must speak to and for America. As women grow in knowledge and authority, she suggests, they might form a Senate 
of their own to counsel the state. Adapting the name of a Spanish political party, she names such a group the Exaltadas, the Exalted Ones. Then this rather abstract proposal takes on substance at a late moment in the book when she returns from exploring history and mythology to the present moment. To my mind, this is a rhetorical climax. This week has brought news, she says, that liberty is in danger. For in the presidential election of 1844, the people have chosen a leader who threatens to rivet the chains of slavery and the leprosy of sin permanently on this nation through the annexation of Texas. In other words, with the election of James K. Polk as president, the people have committed to his plan of taking Texas as new ground for the expanding slave South. Women of my country, Fuller calls out, exultatas, if such there be, have you nothing to do with this? You see the men willing to sell shamelessly the happiness of countless generations of fellow creatures for a money market and political power. Do you not feel within you that which can check, which can convince them? You would not speak in vain, whether each in her own home or banded in unison. Fuller is asking for a counter vote with women's feet and hearts, an opposition government of public protest, which might begin in their traditional sphere, the home, but then rise in effect forming a kind of Senate to the national scale. Her book offers this protest as well as a philosophical meditation and prophecy of change. She calls for action. Persist to ask, she writes in a poem that closes the book, and it will come. As such, when published in 1845, this was among the earliest statements of need for protest within the transcendentalist movement. Emerson had given his first strong anti-slavery speech the summer before, but without calling for opposition. Thoreau hadn't yet moved to Walden Pond, let alone refused to pay his taxes or written his defense of resistance to civil government. All that would unfold in the aftermath, excuse me, in the aftermath of President Polk's war in Texas and Mexico. Fuller led the way in arguing from the natural law of justice to today's news to her reader's obligation to speak accordingly. But so she also took a lead in creation of, of the first wave of American feminism. Woman in the 19th century was not a sole founding document of the women's movement, but its intellectual reach and vision of things to come was unprecedented. Her argument built in particular upon two predecessors, even while forging her own argument. 18th century British feminist Mary Wollstonecraft, as an Enlightenment Unitarian, believed in the mind's direct ability to perceive the order of the universe. As she argued in A Vindication of the Rights of a Woman, if women could remake their minds, unfold their powers, those were her words as well as Fuller's, the subordinate half of humanity would find liberty and claim new ground for the whole race. Fuller silently absorbed such ideas and language from Wollstonecraft while also speaking directly of her controversial character. She conceded that this British woman had been an outlaw by giving birth out of wedlock amidst the French Revolution. In 1845, Fuller embraced revolution and liberty but not what she called libertinism. She hoped for moral purity from her exultatus. In fact, the next three years would bring a major change to Fuller on this ground, as she also bore a child outside marriage as a partisan of the Italian Revolution. She and Wollstonecraft had uncannily similar lives. Excuse me if I keep sipping on my tea here to uh, preserve my voice. Fuller's other predecessors arose, <clears throat> arose from the American anti-slavery movement. In particular, in particular, she was inspired by Sarah and Angelina Grimke, two sisters from South Carolina who had come north 
and forged new ground in public speaking and writing. In her book, Fuller celebrated Angelina Grimke for defying the prohibition of Massachusetts ministers against women speaking in churches by condemning slavery at abolitionist meet gatherings. And Fuller modeled her own arguments on those of Angelina's sister, Sarah Grimke, whose 1837 book, Letters on the Equality of the Sexes, both defended women's public speech and confronted the common law suppression of married women. She commented, it, it may well be an anti-slavery party that pleads for a woman if we consider merely that she does not hold property on equal terms with men. Fuller, Fuller was making a crucial alliance with the Grim Geese. As Virginia Woolf would write in the 20th century, masterpieces are not single and solitary births. They're the outcome of many years of thinking in common. Fuller wrote on the strength of such thinking as both a transcendentalist and an advocate of women's rights. But she spoke with a utopian confidence beyond the range of either Mary Wollstonecraft or Sarah Grimke. That was her transcendental heritage. Both of them ended their works by pleading for support from the powerful men who ran the world. Fuller asked men for attention, but it did not depend on their power. She spoke on her own with a queenly mandate of hopefulness. We would have every arbitrary barrier thrown down we would have every path laid open to woman as freely as to man. Giving voice to possibilities was her unique way of pleading the cause. What offices might women fill? I reply, any, she answered. Let them be sea captains if they will. Her, her most famous line. Fuller published Woman in the 19th century, <clears throat> shortly after leaving Boston for the brief intense years left in her life. Moving to New York City, she wrote as a columnist for the New York Tribune. Then as its foreign correspondent in Europe, she presented the Italian Revolution of 1848 directly to, to American readers. She even wrote of her wish to be America's ambassador to Italy, but recognized that Woman's Day has not yet come, even while hoping to have much to say on that subject if I live. That was a foreboding aside. Her vision was still visionary and redemptive. Her last dispatch to the Tribune spoke hopefully of the next revolution as an advent called Emmanuel, God with us. But it was a future she never saw since tragically she drowned in a shipwreck with her partner, Angelo Ossoli and their child just short of New York Harbor at Fire Island in their escape from post-revolutionary Italy. Now what's fascinating here is the intricate interplay through time and space of Fuller's final days with the opening of the American women's suffrage movement. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott hastily assembled the Seneca Falls Convention in the summer of 1848, just as Fuller, unbeknownst to them, was secluded with her pregnancy in the Italian countryside. Stanton's declaration of sentiments, a forceful parody of the National Declaration of Independence, went beyond Fuller in explicitly decrying the absence of an elective franchise for women. But Stanton's declaration also shared numerous issues with Fuller's lawsuit, especially the American revolutionary promise of freedom and equality and by that standard, women's deprivation of property rights, education, professional channels, legal and religious selfhood. Had Stanton read Fuller? Or was it this just a meeting of minds? Her first speech after the convention makes clear to us now, if not to her audience then, that Fuller was a major source. Stanton not only echoed Fuller on the new era dawning and the divine fire within souls, but silently appropriated whole lines from Fuller's book, including her counsel that women must live first for God's sake and persist to ask for what was needed. As many leaders <clears throat> of the organized movement for women's rights and suffrage declared in retrospect, 
Fuller in her book offered them a vital legacy. Stanton and co-leader Susan B. Anthony declared her the most important precursor in their 1881 history of women's suffrage. Margaret Fuller, they wrote, possessed more influence upon the thought of America than any other woman previous to her time. Fuller's disciple, Carolyn Healy Dahl, zeroed in more specifically on the quality and timing of that influence. Fuller, she said, had stated with transcendent force the arguments which formed the basis of the Women's Rights Convention in 1848. I especially like Dahl's descriptive phrase, transcendent force, evoking the cosmic reach of Fuller's manifesto and its place in the Boston movement, even as it opened the way for politics at Seneca Falls. Another New Englander recalled Fuller instead through her possible leadership of the American movement. Paulina Wright Davis, who organized the first nationwide convention in Worcester in 1850, said that she had actually written to Fuller in Rome asking her to preside. After the shipwreck that summer, we were left to mourn her guiding hand, her royal presence, Davis recalled, but she was and still is a leader of thought. There was always a framework of loss and mourning in recollections of Fuller. In addition, paradoxically related to the mourning, her memory lasted as present day impact. She became a saintly leader a spiritual presence with intensely political impact. I can only give examples here of the ways and means by which Fuller's legacy was felt by the women's rights movement. Through the 1850s, there was a series of annual national conventions with Fuller's voice often in the air. She was invoked and directly mourned by Davis at the first in 1850. Two years later, Sarah Grimke who had retired from the active movement, sent a letter asking them to adopt as a watchword for his prayer, give me truth, cheat me by no illusion, nothing but truth will do. By 1855, the convention took place in Boston under the leadership of Caroline Dahl, who enlisted Emerson to speak and invoked Fuller. Susan B. Anthony attended but also took time to visit Mount Auburn Cemetery in search of Fuller's memorial there. Meanwhile, apart from the conventions, but interwoven with them, writers and journalists offer new, offered new perspectives on Fuller. Her memoirs, edited by male transcendentalist colleagues, became a bestseller in 1852. Then and now, readers have criticized its ambivalent even negative commentary, and its virtual ignoring of women in the 19th century. This was not a feminist statement, but women's rights advocates still appreciated the memoir's narrative of love and death, as well as its offering of previous unpublished writing by Fuller herself. The words about truth that Sarah Grimke quoted to the convention came directly from the memoirs. Caroline Dahl read Fuller's autobiography in the same book and declared that she newly understood her own life as a result. A nearly mythic image of Fuller was growing. Transcendentalism and women's rights came together most consciously, however, in the monthly periodical that first Pauline and Davis and then Dahl edited from 1853 to 55. Its title was The Una, meaning The One, the one mystic truth with its motto, out of the great heart of nature seek we truth. Transcendentalism and its language of nature were very much at home here alongside other literary expression and of course convention reports. Most of all, Dahl urged women in the 19th century upon readers as the deepest thought and clearest utterance of our noblest woman. The Una claimed, aimed at a wider audience of women than would have either attended a convention or spontaneously read Fuller's intellectually challenging manifesto. Dahl became her advocate. But the best ad for Fuller in the Una is a serial novel called Stray Leaves from a Seamstress's Journal. 
its narrator, its narrator is a woman worker, deprived of just wages and disappointed in love, who reads Fuller's book and from it gains what she calls a glimpse of the divine life. We last see her resisting payment of taxes and committing to the movement for women's rights. Fuller is the means to a real conversion experience from inner life to outward action. Through the 1850s, suffrage was part of the women's rights agenda, but just one issue, along with the demand for rights to property and self-development. During, during and after the Civil War, that changed. Activists expected that winning the vote for former slaves would be a spur to the vote for women. And the refusal of that carryover in 1869 was a bitter blow. The 15th Amendment to the Constitution defines suffrage as a privilege of citizenship not to be abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. As Stanton and Anthony declared, it would have been so easy to add sex to that list. Immediately, they withheld consent to the black vote and organized the National Woman Suffrage Association. In response, other women, including many New Englanders, declared themselves willing to accept enfranchisement of former slaves as the need of the moment, pledging themselves to the next step of now winning the vote for themselves, they formed the American Women's Suffrage Association. The split between these two large organizations defined the American women's movement for two decades after the Civil War. They would overcome this rupture and rejoin only in 1890. Voting was now the burning issue. Though the National Association claimed a wider range as well, especially women's right to divorce, and accused the more moderate American of a one-note obsession. Legislative strategies were the order of the day rather than consciousness raising, and there was acrimony on both sides. What place could there be for this sainted figure and spiritual words of Margaret Fuller in such a moment? Pause for a sip of tea. Quite simply, Margaret Fuller's place was still crucial. It was at just this moment of redefining the movement that Paulina Wright Davis declared Fuller to be still a leader of thought. The newspapers of the two parties filled out what kind of leader she was in their respective styles. The American Association founded the, the Women's Journal in 1870 and continued it until 1917 that's 47 years, with headquarters in Boston, just off Beacon Street by the state capitol. I start with that group because it's less known than the Stanton Anthony party, as well as replete with connections to Unitarian and Transcendentalist culture. Lucy Stone, Julia Ward Howe, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, and soon Louisa May Alcott were editors and writers for it. Higginson wrote a column for 15 years declaring that Fuller's great lawsuit was the newspaper's creed. Eventually, both he and Howe would write biographies of Fuller. But the event that won the biggest coverage in the first year of the Women's Journal was the 60-year celebration of Margaret Fuller's birthday in May 1870 in the rooms of the New England Women's Club, just upstairs from the news office in the same building with many members in common. The, cel the club celebrated Fuller with personal testimonies, signs with mottos from women in the 19th century, and a lavish display of flowers, which of course Fuller loved. All the mystic aesthetic splendor of the Una's rendition of Fuller was now augmented, augmented and displayed to an overflowing audience with her portrait draped in purple and surrounded by images of the Greek deities. Indeed, because of news coverage, this birthday story reached readers far beyond Boston. Eventually, annual celebrations of Fuller's birthday spread across the continent, sponsored by a Margaret Fuller club. Fuller was not made to argue for the vote, but she amplified the argument 
as a spiritual sign that the cause was sacred. But then, so did the revolution, the paper of the Stanton Anthony party, tell of Margaret Fuller's birthday celebration in Boston in an issue less than a week after the Women's Journal story. I had thought that its editors kept such spiritual and aesthetic reports at arm's length until my Fuller Society colleague, Denise Cohn, gave a paper on their depiction of Fuller. Thanks to her for welcoming dialogue on the subject. The sense of Fuller in the two papers is virtually the same. I take it that the revolution editors are not only embracing the sacredness that Fuller represented, but in this first year of rupture with the American group, reaching out to them through a value and figure in common. For the tone had changed by six months later, after the American had refused to join with the national in a joint conference of reconciliation. Now an article about Margaret Fuller appeared on the revolution's front page, an excellent gathering of quotations from her work, summing up her message in less ethereal terms in the birthday report. The author declares Fuller's support for the full spectrum of women's rights issues, including her critique of marriage, which points ahead to their own advocacy of divorce rights. And most pointedly, she concludes that Fuller would have been grieved by other advocates who were narrowing the agenda to suffrage alone. Of course, she was speaking of the American Association, brushing them aside in favor of their heroine. Thereafter, the revolution continued to celebrate Fuller. According to Denise, they referred to her 38 times in their three years of publication. Well, no one really won this battle between women's rights party parties, though Stanton and Anthony and associates came close by writing the history of women's suffrage, which has served as the authoritative record of the movement ever since. Antagonism with the American Association had grown to the point that their Boston colleagues like Howe, Stone, Higginson, and Dahl were virtually effaced from the narrative, so that we're even now trying to recover their work. But Stanton and, Stanton and Anthony still embraced Fuller as a preceding cause of the movement, placing her on the list of great women to whom, women to whom they de dedicated their work alongside Wollstonecraft both Grimke's and Paulina Davis, among others. They understood the importance of lineage from one thinker to the next. And they added an appendix to the main narrative, praising Fuller's claim to woman's self-sufficiency and brilliance as a critic. If there's any sense in which the American Association won out over the national, however, it was in the sure, sheer endurance of their newspaper for decades beyond the demise of the revolution. The Women's Journal gave space to voices that were widely heard in their day. Then in 1890, the two organizations finally merged into one national movement for suffrage. But their common allegiance to Fuller remained. Bostonian Enda Dow Cheney, who had attended Fuller's conversations as a teenager, summed up the legacy in addressing a national conference. Cheney said, she planted in my life the seeds of thought, principle, and purpose. And I owe it to her to speak in her name and try to make her life again fruitful in others. In 1901, just over 50 years after Fuller's drowning at Fire Island, members of the movement joined in dedicating a memorial to her on its shores. Higginson, Cheney, and Howe all traveled from Boston to join the New Yorkers. And though Stanton was too elderly by now to travel, she wrote a letter to the still thriving Women's Journal to honor Fuller as one I knew and admired. A year later, a group of women activists from the Cambridge area bought Fuller's birth home, not far from Central Square, to repurpose it as a settlement house for the immigrant workers living nearby. This Margaret Fuller, neighbor Margaret Fuller neighborhood house still survives today 
as a uniquely active tribute to an American author. And the Margaret Fuller Society is currently trying to extend our alliance with it. By these early years of the 20th century, the generation that had known Fuller firsthand was passing. Within a dozen years, Stanton, Anthony, Dahl, Cheney, Howe had all died. This was now a movement focused on the vote. The United National American Women's Suffrage Association was newly challenged by the previously unthinkable tactics of young Alice Paul's National Women's Party, including hunger strikes and pickets of Woodrow Wilson's White House in their final push for suffrage. I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed learning more about those final years in the TV documentaries of this centennial year. There may be more to discover, but I don't know of any conscious valuing of Margaret Fuller as part of the agenda at that point. So to return to my starting place, it's easy to see how in 1920, Catherine Anthony felt that Margaret Fuller could be key to a greater feminism now that suffrage is out of the way. Finding her books unread and old romantic images of her dated, Anthony proposed to take Fuller from the dusty attic for bolder interpretation. Anthony declared she stood at the beginning of two great movements which have reached their culmination in our day, the woman movement in America and the revolutionary mo movement in Europe. Anthony looked at revolutionary, Anthony looked at revolution with an eye to Bolshevik Russia and gender issues through the lens of Freud. She focused particularly on Fuller's awareness of crisscrossing of the sexes and found nothing to apologize for in her sexual emancipation in Italy. Fuller, according to Anthony, was a modern woman who died in 1850. I must say, I, I just rub my eyes at all this, especially since Anthony's work doesn't seem ever to have been recognized by school, Fuller, Fuller scholars or fans of today. Her book caused considerable controversy among reviewers at the time, with the magazine of the National Women's Party praising its potential effect on the day's creative feminism. But there seems to have been very little subsequent response by either Fuller interpreters or women writers more broadly. And at least, however, there is a resonance between some of its themes and then those of the next great feminist, Virginia Woolf. She who wrote that masterpieces are the outcome of many years of thinking in common. I have no evidence that Wolf read Anthony's biography of Fuller, but my colleague Michael Shrimper has been making the case that Wolf did read Fuller herself before writing A Room of One's Own. Certainly the memoirs and probably Woman in the 19th Century as well. Again, I thank him for permission to draw on work that's still unpublished. Wolf certainly loved transcendentalism for she praised Thoreau in 1917 and spoke of his larger group as men and women who lived in an age when thought was remolded in common. At that point, Wolf included the primary woman, Fuller, as the memoirs revealed her among the more ridiculous and grotesque symptoms of transcendentalism. But over the next 12 years, she may have gone deeper, both into Fuller and into feminism. For reading her room alongside Fuller's Woman in the 19th Century reveals deep affinities, specifically literary feminism, scrutiny of women's relation to male dominance, celebration of androgyny, and recommendation of inner spirit as a resource for change. One difference for sure, is that Wolf did not share Fuller's interest in political voice. Having just been granted the vote in England, Wolf wrote in her ironic way <clears throat> that she would rather have a legacy of 500 pounds a year to live on, as well as that room of her own. In the longer run, Catherine Anthony's prediction of Fuller's importance 
her modernism was still fulfilled after Anthony's own lifetime, after readers of Wolf, as well as Simone de Beauvoir and Betty Friedan sparked a second wave in the women's movement. At this point, I can be a witness myself. My 1968 grad school seminar on Emerson and Thoreau didn't even mention Fuller's name, <coughs> even though some significant biographies and anthologies had already located her as a minor transcendentalist. But the 70s brought change, a new recovery of Fuller from the dusty attic, and her elevation to a status alongside Emerson, as well as Stanton, Wolfe, and current feminist thought. Two publications led the way. In her preface, <clears throat> Paul, uh, biographer Paula Blanchard noted that she wrote of Fuller as herself another woman living in the 1970s with an awareness of the questions raised about women in the past decade. And in a concurrent book entitled The Woman in the Myth, Belle-Gale Chevigny newly gathered Fuller's writing alongside the reports, the myths of others. <coughs> Chevigny described Fuller's feminism as crucial, but also what she called a way station to even more comprehensive concern for all oppressed people. Through these books, along with many other readers, and as I navigated my own woman's life in the 70s, I got to know Margaret Fuller. Our interest in her has not flagged since then. My ending thought in celebration of Fuller, as well as the suffrage centennial, is that we, is that we should all grateful, gratefully exercise the elective franchise this fall, not only as a civic duty, but as an act of consciousness and identity. In her own time and circumstance, citizenship certainly had that meaning for Margaret Fuller, had that meaning for Margaret Fuller. And she called out to the exaltadas in another presidential crisis. Have you nothing to do with this? As she wrote, as Sarah Grimke quoted, give me truth, cheat me by no illusion, nothing but truth will do. Let that be a watchword for 2020. I'll say it again, give me truth, cheat me by no illusion, nothing but truth will do. And as she wrote, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton quoted, persist to ask and it will come. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, can you hear me? I can. All right, we, we have a few questions that people have typed in uh, that, that I'd like to read to you. Um, uh, the first one is, uh, you've talked about Fuller's self-reliance as a contrast with Waldo Emerson. Would you like to talk more about the differences between them as transcendentalist leaders? I also recently reread parts of Waldo Emerson's contribution to Fuller's memoirs and was struck by his denigration of her mysticism and her embrace of gender fluidity, mm. almost viscerally threatened by the breadth of her thought. I agree with all that about uh, Emerson's report in the memoirs. Um, I would also say that uh, he had a, a really vibrant conversation with her over the years, and um, I don't feel like simply dismissing him. I do feel that self, the, the phrase self, it, 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 where, where Fuller talks about self-reliance is in uh, the portrait of Miranda. She's telling about her learning and her independence in life, and she uses the phrase self-reliance to describe herself. Um, but I, I'm saying that what that means for her primarily is that she's self-reliant as a woman. <coughs> Excuse me again. <coughs> uh, she's, she's, and is not dependent on men either as an intellectual or in a marriage. Or indeed, she doesn't talk about friendships with men. So that, that, that to take that term and use it as a way of dividing 
the two genders, I think is a really uh, uh, subversive appropriation of uh, transcendental doctrine. Their leadership in the movement. Uh, uh, obviously, Emerson wrote essays and gave lectures, became nationally and internationally known for on a much more modest scale, but still uh, a great and pioneering one, went from conversations with women to her manifesto, Woman in the 19th Century, to her journalism. Uh, she was a, a bold innovator. She uh, led the movement and she led away from the movement too. She saw a life beyond Boston and transcendentalism. Thank you. Uh, next question, um, where on a spectrum from ambivalent on one end to radical on the other end, where on the spectrum of ambivalent to radical of abolitionism uh, did Fuller fall, uh, given her political religious logic in 19th century <laughs> woman, uh, she seems she must have fallen closer to the radical end of the spectrum. A really important question and a tough one, uh, and, and of course really uh, important and loaded for this year when we are thinking ab uh, about how Black Lives Matter. Uh, I don't feel that Black Lives Mattered enormously to Margaret Fuller. I'm going to have to be honest. She was, she was more interested in making adopting the women abolitionists like the Grimkeys, for whom the black slaves mattered intensely. But it was their heroism and their publicity and their nobility that she celebrates rather than, rather than their cause. At the same time though, I don't want to go too far with that because she describes America itself as flawed by the institution of slavery. She never hesitates by that on that, whether it's the Mexican War <coughs> or after when she's in Europe, right up to her last dis dispatch from revolutionary Rome. So she, on the, uh, on the ideological level, she was surely anti-slavery. I don't find that she was an advocate for uh, African-Americans the way she was for women. I'd love to have some pushback from somebody on that. Thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, can you summarize Fuller's relationship with Waldo Emerson and Elizabeth Peabody? Summarize? <laughs> Could I write a book about that? <laughs> or two or three? Um, We've got a debate at nine o'clock. So. <laughs> Say that again, right? We we do we do want to get to the debate. Um, uh, she sought out Emerson as a colleague and a mentor, uh, and it was a very fruitful relationship on both sides. They when they were not together, they corresponded um, voluminously and profoundly, uh, and and uh, all of that has been analyzed by various scholars, Christina Suarez most uh, centrally, um, so that uh, uh, Emerson was an important element, I feel, in, uh, in, in uh, Fuller becoming herself. But she diverged, she, she resented him, uh, she was inclined to want to fall in love with him, and uh, he uh, wouldn't hear any of that. There was tension between him and Lydia and his wife. On the interpersonal level, it was a mess. Uh, and he, and uh, she separated uh, increasingly from him and uh, identified in, in, in with uh, the women in her conversations. And beyond that, as for <clears throat> Elizabeth Peabody, Peabody was older, more moderate, more thoroughly Unitarian, a, a, a disciple of William Mary Channing's. Uh, she uh, pioneered, however, 
in uh, interpreting the scriptures in a new, innovative, uh, semi-mythical, certainly morally allegorical way, and uh, published and uh, encouraged Fuller to publish. Fuller never really appreciated her. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of tension between them as well. Uh, and some unpleasant words exchanged between the two of them. But uh, Peabody faithfully attended and transcribed the conversations uh, and uh, contributed to the memory of Margaret Fuller after her death. I feel that uh, Peabody is a, a great figure and one we really need to recover and, and find out more about uh, as, as is indeed going on right now. <laughs> Thank you. Here's another question. Uh, as sharp of a thinker as she was, did she or any of her transcendentalist contemporaries tend to have an arrogant streak in them that may have turned off some of their intended audience? Uh, I read once, I read that she once said that she never met an intellect comparable to my own. <laughs> well, uh, sure, there was, there was some of that. Uh, uh, th that that has been part of the myth of Margaret Fuller, the negative myth. Uh, Thomas Carlyle said uh, he had heard that she had decided to accept the universe, and he said, by gad, she'd better. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and that's been quoted and requoted, uh, as, as well as the line about uh, not meeting anyone whose intellect was greater than her own. Uh, I would like to balance that streak in her with her leadership of other women in the conversations. There was certainly um, some of her uh, imperial ways, but also very much trying to get other women to talk, which just wasn't happening in, in school or in society at that point. Uh, you know, uh, the encouragement of discussion was a new concept. Uh, she, uh, she was very generous in extending that and asking uh, the important questions uh, about who we are and what can we do with our lives. Uh, similarly, uh, in, in, uh, in Europe, she became a revolutionary in common cause with rich and poor people in Rome and uh, ended up as a nurse in a military hospital uh, at the same time as her, her union with Angelo Ossoli. Uh, I can't square any of that with her uh, being um, simply arrogant. So I would jump to her defense. Thank you. I wish I could. I wish I could hear back what the questioners say, <laughs> but but I know we can't really have that kind of conversation. I do have another another question for you. I love the way you begin and end with Anthony's 1920 biography. Do you know of any projects that take biographies of Fuller as their subject? I am so interested in the project you inspire with your talk about reading Fuller through biographers' eyes at particular. Huh moments in women's history. I can never resist pick up, picking up a biography when I see one and the collection is getting uh -huh. in <laughs> Well, the questioner probably knows that we have had a, the most remarkable uh, outpouring of biographies of Fuller uh, in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Great biographies, uh, of which I will mention Charles Capper's voluminous two-volume two uh, study. And uh, Megan Marshall, our, our colleague here tonight, who won the Pulitzer uh, not long ago for her brilliant biography of Fuller that really gets inside her feelings, her uh, as well as her intellectual life and uh, 
represents her in a most sympathetic way. Um, I think that I don't know of a study of all the biographers from, say, the memoirs through Higginson and Howe to Catherine Andes Anthony to the present day. That would be spectacular. Uh, but I am in that in that list. I'm especially interested in Anthony because she's uh, different in her particular World War I political and gender radicalism and uh, the fact that she just hasn't been picked up by anybody. So I think I will want to have more to say about her. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, I've got two questions uh, kind of wrap up. And these two questions, I think, um, you, you may want to consider together. One, okay. uh, what particular aspects of Fuller's vision do you think you would most benefit from attending to or working to realize at this moment in history? Uh. Uh, in a similar vein, what would Fuller think of the state of women in America today? Okay. Um, again, uh, a, a challenge to, to respond to that. Uh, I'll take the second one first. She would certainly be uh, impressed by the extent of women's emergence uh, to professional and political and intellectual power. That would be thrilling to her. I don't think that she would uh, hesitate still to be critical of uh, women's slipshod uh, handling of their own lives, their, their attitudes of, of dependence and their uh, failure to take action. So that, you know, her call to exultatas in, in 1845, I think can still be uh, leveled at any of us and me most of all in uh, 2020. Uh, so there would be there would be plenty of room for critique. Um, remind me of the first question again, please, Victor. Are you there? Mute myself. What aspects of Fuller's vision do you think we would most benefit from attending to or working to realize at this moment in history? Well, I guess I've implied some of that, um, that, that, that our, the combination of, of um, selfhood, of self-reliance, of self-knowledge with bonding uh, together. Uh, Fuller was a socialist, but became, became a socialist. She believed in, in uh, joint action when she asked women to uh, protest in their homes or collected together. Obviously, it's the second she wants to move toward uh, so that, uh, uh, of course, some of these things are happening in the 21st century as they weren't then. Uh, th there are many organizations for women in, in politics and in intellectual life and in religious life. Uh, but uh, as well as collect collections with men and women together, which she, she was certainly never a, se a complete separatist. She thought of women's withdrawing from uh, union so that they could become units, but then her goal was still the union. Uh, so I think that, that all the, the balance points between selfhood and uh, united action between uh, women's uh, self-knowledge and union with men. Um, those are still really vital issues for us today. And in the, in the election of 2020, uh, I will go back to I, uh, uh, the way she would Deplore, I will just be honest, Donald Trump's fraudulence, <laughs> may I name him, and, and, and corruption and uh, uh, violence. 
uh, these would, these things would be appalling to her. She would certainly be a, a leader of the opposition. Well, thank you very much, Phyllis. Uh, really appreciate uh, all that you uh, all that you shared with us, uh, and thank you to uh, all of you who attended the uh, the lecture tonight. And uh, uh, please do uh, bookmark the the uh, uh, our Eventbrite. Uh, page. We will have more events coming up for the Transcendentalism Council and follow us on Facebook. Uh, and we'll hope to see and hear from you again. Thank you very much to everybody and Victor uh, and Shelley for sponsoring this. It's been, it's been a great ride. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.